I say something, like I quoted the wrong document. But it all worked out, I corrected myself in class. I said something about Marbury versus Madison. I'm gonna say it one more time about this, this Marbury versus Madison, because we're gonna talk about the uh, Article Three, the judicial branch. But Marbury versus Madison talks about that uh, executive doing what he wants and supposing, oh, this is what I said about the oath. I said something last week about the oath for the governor of Virginia. Article 4 of the Virginia Constitution talks about the legislature and it tells about oaths. Everybody who takes an oath shall say, accept the civil and political authority <coughs> of all men before the law, all men, and then I will faithfully perform the duty of, let's say, the governor to the best of my ability, to the best of his ability, so that the governor can, with this oath, completely fail, <laughs> because it's according to their own ability, and, you know, the Lord's grace will be sufficient for them. And then Virginia, it says, so help me God, it's actually part of the oath, just like in Blah 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 here. Oh, cause of Shalom 
peculiar de delicacy in this case, a novelty of some of its circumstances, real guilt of difficulty attending the points which occur that require exposition of the principles on which the opinion to be given by the court is founded. And look what I wrote, that in italics, I said, introduction to an excuse for ruling on the merits, notwithstanding the court only had jurisdiction made a simple declaration that original jurisdiction for the subject matter in parties was not granted in the U.S. Constitution. Sounds like a lawyer would say that. There's a lot of run-on sentence there. But the point is here, let's see what happens here. If you're going to continue down, it says two more paragraphs down, in order which the court has reviewed, reviewed the subject, the following questions have been considered and decided before we do anything. It turns out with law and courts, they don't want to get involved. You see them dismissing cases all day long. Why courts dismiss cases? There's several reasons. One, they're too busy. And the more cases they can dismiss, the better. Okay? And then also, you have all these weird little tech, oh, they got thrown out on technicality. Hey, that's not just the technicality, it's justice. The government has to be perfect. If it's going to do God's job on earth, it has to do it perfectly. So if you start having some procedure that was unlawful that gets them into the courtroom and somebody says, wait, that violated the law of getting here. Okay, dismiss it. It can't be just if there's injustice in the procedure. It's automatically Inside. Yeah, it's already failed. So let's not waste our time on something that's dysfunctional. Dismiss it. Okay, we, what's the next case? So what courts do, first of all, they say, should you be here? Matthew, uh, they've got to say, if they want to try Matthew, if they want to say that this court is where we need to bother Matthew, they better say that Matthew lives in Hampton before they take him to Hampton District Court. Okay, they've got to establish jurisdiction on the person. And then they have to tell the court what law in Virginia allows this court to entertain what we're talking about. It's two questions, the person, the parties, and the subject matter. If, if it doesn't apply, dismiss. Next. That's the first two questions. We, we don't even need to be looking at this. We're not the right person to look at this. Get it out of here. Dismiss. They don't go and look at the facts and then make a determination, make a big explanation of the law, and say, oh, by the way, it's dismissed. They don't do that. Let's see what Marbury versus Madison did. Um, look at the paragraph one. Has the applicant, uh, these are the questions we're going to review. Has the applicant a right to the commission he demands? He was suing. The, and I'll tell you a little bit more, more about that. So he was suing him because he said he was supposed to get a demission, a commission and Mr. Madison didn't deliver it and all this kind of stuff. Look what I put. Not relevant. Jurisdiction is always the first question. So you don't put that there. It should not be the, the way that you review it unless you're doing judicial activism. If you're going to publish an opinion on something that you have no authority to but it'll get it in the law book. Okay, number two, if he has a right and that right has been violated, do the laws of this country afford him a remedy? I put not relevant. And the other two years, you some legal jargon, but what's not relevant? The only thing that's relevant is number three, the last thing you, you looked at. If they do afford him a remedy, does the mandamus issuing from this court? In other words, does this court have the subject matter jurisdiction? The first two questions are who are the parties and, and what's the subject matter? If they can't, if you can't get through that threshold, these other two things don't even come up. You don't look at the evidence, you don't waste your time, you got better things to be doing. But what they did here was, in Marbury, and I've never, nobody told me that, but now that I'm looking at this, I'm going, wait a minute. And I read through the thing, and it turns out, it's effectively what they would call dictum. It's just, it's just randomly kind of nice to know information, but not relevant. And then, so if you go to page seven, so flip that sheet you've got over. You see that quote, see in bold? What's that bold, Jason, on page seven? The government of the United States has been um, emphatically, emphatically claimed a government of laws and not of men. Well, that's something that Blackstone said over and over. So that Sir Edward Cook, 100 years before that, had said over and over. You go back to the Magna Carta, it's said over and over, over again. But there, it's almost like we keep citing Marbury Madison as the one that's like, oh. No, they're just stating the obvious. Okay? It's government, it's something we've said here. It's government of law, not men. Go to the page 14, which is the next sheet you have. So what, and what I will tell you throughout this, if you actually read this 
17 pages, you'd see him quoting Sir William Blackstone several times. So he's always taking what everybody already knows. He's not saying anything new. He's just applying it. This is like copy, paste, right? Just goes right here, where it applies. Um, this is a good thing I gave you because I'll probably end up later, now that I've given it to you, actually pose some questions. Where do these compare? Look at this thing. It says, Governor of the United States in the bold letters is, it goes on to describe, powers of legislature are defined and limited. And those limits may not be mistaken or forgotten the Constitution uh, as it's written. Uh, and then you go down the next underlying thing, distinction between government with limited and unlimited powers is abolished if those limits do not confine the persons on whom they are imposed and if acts prohibited and acts allowed are a legal obligation. Um, so it goes on to say, it is proposition to claim to be contested that the Constitution controls any legislative act repugnant to it or that the legislature may alter the Constitution by an ordinary act. So these are the kind of things, almost like it's been, uh, this is the first time that somebody has put in writing the obvious, okay? He's taking things that were said in the Federalist Papers by those who drafted the Constitution. He's taking things that Sir William Blackstone published just not too, what, 40, 34 years before, 35 years before, something like that. And he's taking those same things that everybody at that time knew and just, Copy paste. This is where it applies. Um, and then it goes down the next bold section. Uh, oh, in the place where it's highlighted. I don't know if yours is highlighted. It's sort of. Uh, then it, it talks about acts contrary to the Constitution is not law. And it goes back and violates the natural law or the revealed law, which is the Bible, natural law. And then what he talked about here, he used the term fundamental law. That's the structure of authority now. Natural, fundamental, that's the Constitution, and then positive law. So we're going to look at that here shortly. And then the last thing is look on page, are you on 14 or 15? We were on 15. I was on 15. Okay. Uh, either way, I'm just going to summarize and we're going to go and you're going to open up your, your textbook to the Constitution. Also, I want, I want to say here there was another statement in your textbook. <coughs> that quoted, and this is a problem I have with A. Beckham, they quoted a thing that says that the, the job of the um, Supreme Court is to interpret the Constitution. And they were attributing that to this John Marshall statement in Marbury versus Madison. He didn't say that, actually. And I, I, thought, I hate that statement. Because I was always of the opinion that the judge, judge's job is to find out what the law is. They're fixed, and we'll talk about that here shortly as we review the Constitution. There's fixed and variable law. Law is, it's not changing. God created it, it works in every situation, it's always there. Okay? And what he did is he actually, when I read Marbury versus Madison, he agreed with me. He says the job of the judiciary is to find out what the law is. And then to interpret the rules. Well, the law is this, the law is this, and then this. Now, how do we apply that? What's the rule we use when sorting out these things when they conflict? Okay? So the law is. Their job is to find out what it is. And then the interpretation part comes with facts and circumstances. And uh, to see, see how everything lines up, which law is higher, is it revealed law? You know, which can this law uh, supersede something that's higher? Open up your textbook to, um, oh, by the way, I brought something for you, because I know you guys are going to want to read this. This is, uh, 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 let me, I, I, before we open up the textbook, the final decision was in the Constitution, and we're going to look at this, where the Constitution has given the Supreme Court a job, that's the job they're going to do. It turns out this suing, this lawsuit that came before them wasn't in the list that the Constitution gave the Supreme Court to do. It was some other trivial thing. And if Congress wants to write a law that the Supreme Court can review it, if somebody appeals it to them, then they'll entertain the question. But they were actually suing in the United States Supreme Court, originally. You look at the facts, that's not their job. Their job at that point, based on the Constitution, is if they figure out some way to sort these things out at a lower level, they want to come talk to them, go ahead and do it. And that's what the judgment was. We can't even review this statement. They finally said, we cannot review this question because it's not our job. And they kicked it out. But before they did, they acted as if they had actually tried the case. So that's why I 
state will be judicial activism. And here's another little bit of trivia. The thing on Marbury versus Madison, it turns out, Johnson appoints a judge, he signs the document after the Senate concurred, he signs the document, he gave it to his secretary, John Marshall, the secretary of state who puts it in the record book, he takes it from Adams and sees, oh, Mr. Marbury is a judge, okay, you've signed it, I'll put the seal on it, <laughs> okay, now let me stick it in the file book. So he was a party to the whole issue. And now he's judging the case as a Supreme Court justice. So just six months earlier, he was a guy who put it in the record book. So again, I think there was a little bit of a association passion that was influencing what was going on here. Nobody ever talks about that. I just noticed, I, I've never noticed before that he was a party to the case. Let's go to your textbook, Article 3. And now you see this is the advanced class. You're going, ah, it's going to come up later, and you're going to remember this maybe. We'll see. So what page are we on in 250-something, right? 245. 245. 245. Okay, Matthew, you're going to read paragraph one just so I won't. In federal court? Yep, that's it. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from one time to time ordain and establish. The judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. Wow. So any judge who's appointed according to this Article 3 is in there for life. And in your chart, in your textbook, in your textbook it showed you, now what page were we on in Section 8? You know, I'm looking at all these cute little charts you have over here. So when they, at least they cited their own error. It's, uh, go back to page 141. Hold your place there with the Constitution. Go back to page 141. See this chart? They're putting a chart of showing you in blue, in blue the courts that are formed under this Article 3 where you get appointed a judge and they'll be there forever until they die for good behavior. So that means if they lose their mind, somebody could impeach them. Say, you know, so-and-so's got Alzheimer's, probably a good idea not to either give them any cases or let's just go ahead and retire them. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, that's one of the good behaviors that would be required, I would think. But those things in blue, okay, the U.S. Supreme Court is under Article 3. Okay, we just told us about it. Now, those inferior courts. So what they did to manage the business load, what they did is they have, they used to have, they called them circuit courts. And they, Congress came up with these little circuit courts that would try some cases and then it would go on appeal to the Supreme Court. If it was a criminal case, then they could appeal by right you need to have somebody else do it because if somebody can't get their head chopped off for a crime. Uh, if it was merely um, a strange civil lawsuit, the Supreme Court doesn't have to entertain it. They're too busy. they got too many criminal cases that are on appeal. So if there's some trivial issue about your property right or something like that, I mean, they may very well may not, not even pay attention to it because they're, they're too busy. Okay? But that's Supreme Court, Article 3. Now, just looking, uh, what else is in blue there? It says U.S. Courts of Appeal. Okay, and below that it says what? U.S. District Court. U.S. District Courts. There's one in uh, Newport News, there's one in Richmond, there's one in uh, Norfolk, and they're under the Eastern District of the United States, the Fourth District Eastern Section of the United States. So if you ever hear it went to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, that means it would have been in this area of the country, and it was in one of these courts around here, this Fourth District, rather 12th District, and it's this is where you would, if you're going to get uh, charged with a crime of, um, I was at a bank the other day, and there was counterfeit bills. This guy had a counterfeit $20 bill that when he went to make his deposit, they wouldn't deposit it, you know? Uh, so that was kind of interesting. So let's say you get charged with a counterfeit. It would be, your the court would be this U.S. Federal District Court. It wouldn't be the Hampton District. charged with a crime, a federal crime, what court would you most likely be taken to? Federal, federal District Court. And if you didn't like the judgment, you'd go to the Court of Appeal. Let's look at this other chart. They're showing you the ones in blue. These judges will be there forever until
until they go loopy or something like that. And they're going to have this, they're not going to have their pay diminished, even in times of recession. Okay? Let's look at the next thing. It says U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. I got to visit that one day. It was very exciting. Fortunately, it was not on a criminal charge, but uh, I had something up for them. And look at below that. So they, they've also made these other courts, the U.S. Court of Appeals of the Federal Circuit. Those, were, those are per, pretty much for uh, pretty important cases that have to do with the government. Like if you're going to sue the United States and it's going to be appealed, it's going to be going to the U.S. Court of Appeals of the Federal Circuit. Very, uh, you know, these guys are big eggheads that really concentrate on some of those really intense constitutional issues and stuff like that. Now below it, they say U.S. Claims Court. Guess what? They lied. That should be in white. That is not an Article Three court. The next one they have in blue is U.S. Court of International Trade. So if other foreign countries who are making uh, on treaty deals, they would all be in this Article Three. That means that this first pa paragraph here, they don't get their compens, the judges don't get their compensation diminished, and they're under this article of the Constitution. They're guided by this. They're controlled by this. Now let's go to the next section. On, we're on page 245. Section two, the jurisdiction of the federal courts. This is where Marbury versus Madison should have jumped right to that point and say, who are the parties and what's the subject matter? So what's it saying? We'll go to Hunter, read section two of the article three. Jurisdiction of federal courts. Yep. The judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this uh, constitution, the laws of the United States, and the treaties made, or which shall be made under their authority, to all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls, uh, to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction, to controversies to which the United States shall be a party, to controversies between two or more states, between a state and citizens of another state, between citizens of the same state claiming lands under grants of different states, and between the state or the citizens thereof, and foreign to state citizens or subjects. And that little italicized part was changed by an amendment later. The point here is, um, Secretary of State Madison was not in this list. So when he was sued in the U U.S. Supreme Court by Marbury, he wasn't in this list. He was not a party to whom the uh, jurisdiction would, would bring it to this court. So all they had to do is go, <laughs> wait a minute, we didn't establish jurisdiction, find someplace else to go. And it also turned out there was an, another remedy. He could have just sued to get the piece of paper. You don't actually have to sue Madison in order to do something. They actually had a copy of this document in the records, and there's a different case that you could have taken to one of these legal penalty courts and just had somebody gone in the, in the clerk's office and get the copy. So it, it was, okay, sorry. In other words, there was no jurisdiction. Okay. Um, and then it goes on. Let's continue down. Uh, it talks about some certain things. Then look at this. This last paragraph is very important for your liberties. Last paragraph on 245. Parker, read the last paragraph. The trial of all crimes except in cases of impeachment shall be by jury. Such trial shall be Stop. Trial of what crime? All impeachment. No, what? impeachment all. is the only thing that would be impeaching the president. Congress does that, right? House, okay, presided by the Senate. But the trial of how many crimes? All. All crimes. Does that mean citizens? Yes. Or non-citizens? Was it a United States court subject to the Constitution of the United States? Doesn't matter what they are, it's what who is, is the court. Is the court the United States? Is the person representing government power of the United States? Then they play by the United States rule book. Trial of all crimes, all crimes. Hmm. So when things come up in the news here in the next who knows when, just remember that. Let's back up a little bit. Oh, here's the thing it says, I, I do want to go on because this is an issue of the day with the Guantanamo thing. But when 
not committed within any state, the trial shall be at such place or places as the Congress may by law have directed. So if they've got some place they've got to do, like Guantanamo Bay or something like that, Congress has to get involved and figure out what are we going to do with it. It's a trial of a crime. Citizen or not citizen, doesn't matter. But it was outside the states, so where, where are we going to handle this? And so the Constitution gave them authority to come up with that. So let's back up a little bit. Okay, before we go, does anybody have any question on that? Question for anybody's brain? See, a lot of this, people don't think of this. I, I, I <coughs> news reports, people arguing over different things. You just go back and look at the rule book and stay with this confined spaces, we save ourselves a lot of calorie burning. Let's let's back up to section two. This is something that I want to want you to look at here. Section two, the first line. I'm gonna read. The judicial power shall extend to all cases. Now watch this. There's actually an authority structure here that they're gonna point out. In law and equity, so there's a difference between law and equity, and you're going to get a little education here on that, arising under the Constitution, that's cases that arise under the Constitution, the laws of the United States, so there's a difference between law of equity and the laws of the United States, they're different things, and treaties made, that's different than the laws of the United States, in fact, the treaty can be made, ratified by the Senate, and imposes something on Virginia, whether Virginia likes it or not. So a treaty is different than the law of the United States. So there's things Congress, Congress can't do that. They've elevated treaties in this to have a really interesting power. But they've described law and equity, laws of the United States and treaties. Law, how do we know when you're talking about law and this authority structure of law, what's the highest law? What is the highest law? The revealed law, which is found where? In the Bible. In the Bible. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, it, Blackstone even mentions times, sundry times in special revelation. You know, it gives somebody illumination. It's revealed law. Um, and that, I mean, they contemplated that in the law system as the government, as it was, you know, those who were founding this government. The, the next law, which be natural law, revealed law, the law of nature, and that's where it comes down to reason, your, your logic, and justice. What is equitable? We can't really see it in the Bible. We see that Congress has made a law of the United States that's actually caused problems in this situation. So what's equitable? In other words, let's put some information here on this side of the scale. Let's put some information here on this side of the scale. See how those scales of justice balance, and if we see a tip, we got to use our reason. If we can't get it out of the Bible, and it's the law of the United States that's causing problems, how do we balance the scales? So that's, you see the scales of justice. So there's fixed law that comes from God that you cannot change, and those things that he's sort of indifferent to, you know, he hasn't expressly said in the Bible, and, and it's, there's some kind of conflict. That's when equity comes in. It's not written. In the, in the specific laws, it's not written in the Bible. We're going to figure out, have to figure out how to do justice. That's what equity is. Okay. Um, and then, all cases of law and equity arising out of the Constitution, the laws of the United States. So those are the laws that God is indifferent to. That the Congress gets <laughs> together and they make a a law that just seems right in our community. Okay. And then there are treaties. Treaties again, once they're ratified by the Senate, affect Virginia. They can make a decision, and I said this, I, I wrote this little letter in Senate to folks. I sent a letter to Senator Warner because I said, hey, you know, this uh, UN Convention on Persons with Disabilities sounds really neat. It's huge, got all these great moral imperatives, but it's going to be a committee. It's a little committee of Tibetans and South Africans and Brazilians and communist Chinese or whoever, outside the United States, outside of Hackney, Virginia, who are coming up with a policy over how to handle disabled people in Virginia. And if you ratify this treaty, somebody in a committee elsewhere, a little city council of the United Nations in New York or <coughs> wherever we meet that week, okay, is gonna make a determination that's gonna have the power
matter of law in Virginia that the courts of Virginia actually have to abide by because of the U.S. Constitution. Congress didn't have the power to pass that law, but because you've ratified this treaty and you've elevated treaties to being so much value that it could actually change what happens in your state to you, about you. In fact, UN Convention on the Rights of the Child may say Jason has so much right, he can come to the court and tell his parents to take a hike. Because, oh, yeah. because this UN Convention on the Rights of the Child says it upholds his rights so much so that it may trump the teaching of his parents. And if they ratify that treaty, they sign it, but if it's ratified, suddenly somebody external to the United States has the power to affect what happens in Virginia, and the courts in Virginia have to abide by it. Okay, so, do they have any question on that? So, how many laws are there? What are the laws that they said? They, that's four things. What was the first thing listed? All cases in. You can look, you can cheat. What were the four things? Law, equity. Law, equity. equity. Uh, laws States. of the United States, that's and Acts of Congress, and treaties. So, law, that's fixed, revealed, natural. Equity is natural law. Good reason, figure out what the right thing to do, notwithstanding what the law of the United States is, and treaties. But all of these have the power and force of law. So somebody says, hey, you're violating law. Congress said the following thing. Yeah, but the Bible says this. Wait a minute, you're not obeying law. No, yes, I am obeying law. What we need to do is figure out what are we going to do. Sometimes Congress will pack, pass a law that they know will maybe be an offense. It may not work in every situation. And if there's somebody in there that's not working with them, you know, they have a choice. Either they can just not bother that person. And, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing they do with religion. If religion, you get away with some kind of strange religious thing like you're doing uh, this, uh, this one case where they were, I cited in my letter where they had this strange tea they were drinking for their communion. And it was contrary to the drug act. That's a United Nations treaty, you know? But if it violates religion, you just gotta leave them alone. Let it, gotta let them have their communion, you know? Because it now falls under law, the revealed law, instead of laws of the United States and treaties, okay? All right, now, the last thing is I'm burning your brain cells. Let's go to section three. There's a biblical precept in here. It's on page 246. Okay, Isaac, read. First paragraph, section three.
our fourth spirit, it says stirring life, bringing new life into the person of Christ. Okay. A little history here. In England especially, this is some of the things that happened. Some of those crazy Presbyterians who ran around saying, my king is Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church. King of England is not the head of the church. Jesus is the king of the church. Ah, oh, that's treasonous. Okay, so what they would do, not only would they cut the person's head off or whatever, and cut them, and I won't tell you this thing. But the things that would do, not only would they do that to them, they would make sure that their posterity were kicked out of the home. They would take their lands and goods, and they would exclude them from, from different rights. It turned out that the next generation, because they were associated by family to that person who was convicted, you know, the next king that would come in may bless the person who just got killed. You know? So what they would do is they would basically impose, make a civil incapacities on people whose parents or father or whatever was accused of treason. So what they did said this thing about it's called no corruption of blood. So when you see this term no corruption of blood, that's what they were talking about. That you would not uh, punish somebody because of their blood relation. Now in scripture there's a prohibition in the Old Testament that says that the sins of the father shall not be held accountable to the son and the sins of the son will not be held accountable to the father. It says that he's going to take that God can pass the sins to the third and the fourth generation. And that's his prerogative. That's his original jurisdiction. But as far as us, we don't have the authority to pass punishment on Christians because of David McCain's behavior. We don't have the authority to do that. God can do that, but we don't. So the question came up with uh, Mitt Romney, the guy who's not going to be the president in the next four years. Um, who knows about the future, right? When he says, well, what about abortion in the case, case of incest? So how would how would this idea in law, this is just talking about federal jurisdiction. Hunter, don't leave me. How does this idea of incest in relation to this no corruption of blood? Should a somebody have the right to kill a baby, should kill you, no matter how old you are, because of the sins of your father. Right? I don't know. You're not with me, are you? Okay. So asleep, there's a principle in here with regard to these issues of the day. If we come to the Constitution, there's authority structure. Even in a case of treason, okay, a capital crime, you can't punish the next generation for the sins of the perpetrator. All right. Incest is who is the sin say a rape who's the perpetrator of rape the rapist okay it's not the baby we don't have authority in law to justify murder of the innocent next generation okay so if if the subject comes up a lot of people say in fact there was a senator Murdoch and I, I don't know what state he was in but he was running to be Senate. And what he did is somebody asked him about, well, what about the case of rape and incest stuff like that? And he said, well, I believe. That's you know great about the politician saying, I believe. It's like nobody cares what he believes. I mean, you say, I believe this. Well, there's no substance to it. There's no nothing really motivating you to behave any certain way. It's just sort of a belief. You're just one of many. But there's principles in law that have always been there that we don't have the authority to punish the baby for the activities of the father. We're not saying it's a good situation. Okay? But God throughout scripture shows that he's interested in protecting in the shedding of innocent blood. Even that the perpetrator would even in some cases go free. Okay, so that's the thing I want you to take with you in here. These principles that are in the scripture are also in the constitution. And if all we have is this constitution that is neat little line about corruption of blood. What's that? What are they talking about? Oh, that's archaic. It doesn't apply. No, it does. It does apply. Okay. Whether you like it or not, I've just bombarded you. Now, what's the syllabus say?
the residue. Oh, by the way, in this Marbury versus Madison um, case, the court said that it was the purpose of government, not of creation, the protection of government to protect the people in their and the absolute rights of intervention of individuals. So we actually, in this statement, cited this. I have not finished those questions, but I gave you that absolute rights of individuals. What you're gonna do is your next section is on the Bill of Rights is on the Bill of Rights. So what you're gonna do, you're gonna do the section in your book. If I messed up on the pages, you know, make sure you, if I give you a, a review assignment, obviously reading up to the review assignment is implied. And then by Monday, you're gonna get the uh, questions on the absolute rights of individuals as it relates to your assignment, okay? So, are there any questions? Military appeals. U.S. Tax Court. 
Weird but true, if you want to go to the U.S. tax court, you actually have to say, hi, I'd like to come to court on this issue. What's neat, I, I just read this today, it's kind of weird. And you say, what? No, they can take your stuff, and you can choose to go to the tax court to get it back. But you don't have to. Because, it turns out, this Judiciary Act that they came up with in uh, Marbury versus Madison, it's only a few paragraphs long, but this is an uh, annotated code where here's the statute, and then you read all these court cases that relate to it. And you can study on the law and its application. So, uh, it's sick when I read these things for entertainment. So, it talks about jurisdiction of court. And if you get your money taken from the, the tax people, you can go to a tax court. Hi, can you guys deal with my situation? Or you can go to a U.S. district court and sue on taxes that have been taken. You can't stop the tax from being taken. You've got to do it after the fact. But if the tax is taken unlawfully, you, you could go to a U.S. district court and get the full benefits of Article Three constitutional protections of the law, or you can go to the tax court and go by the, the United States Code Congress's uh, tax rules. It's your prerogative. In some cases, if you choose the tax court, there's certain things that they can't review in the district court once you've done that. A little trivia, okay? Well, so that's something. I, I wasn't planning about talking about that, but that's that's the difference between an Article One Congress uh, created court and Article Three constitutional, you know, all the rights and law and equity and all those common law procedures. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I've been there.